Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today we are on to week four in our flight mechanics class. So I thought what we would do is let's just go through our usual cadence and talk about the roadmap of where we're headed uh, this week. So um, let's just start with this first discussion. So we are going to finish up our discussion of using rotation matrices to uh, basically express vectors in different frames, right? If you remember, we've been doing this now for several weeks, right? We talked about these direction cosine matrices back in week two. And in fact, we actually started um, this discussion all the way back in week one, right? And the thing that we were looking at during all of the previous weeks with all of these rotation matrices is we actually made the implicit assumption that all of these frames of reference that we were trying to express the vectors in, all of them had the same origin, namely that they weren't translated, uh, their origins were not translated uh, with respect to one another, right? They all had the same origin. Therefore, it was okay to use the rotation matrices the way we had earlier. What I like to look at now is, well, what happens if you have two frames where there might actually be both a rotation and a translation um, to set those two frames apart? Can we still use this idea of a type of matrix to transform from one frame to another? And the answer is yes. And in fact, that's what we're going to look at right here in this first discussion. So instead of having just a pure rotation matrix, we actually need to take into account the translation as well. So this is going to lead to the development of what's known as a homogeneous transformation matrix. It's sort of like a generalized rotation matrix, which also can take into account translations. So that's what this first discussion is. And in fact, maybe now might be a good time to actually jump over to the homework because homework four, as you can see here, the first problem is actually dealing with this quite extensively. So in this picture, you can see in this case, we've got, uh, I've kind of contrived and made up this example. Let's pretend that you've got this underwater vehicle. It's like a submarine maybe. And again, we can attach some kind of, uh, maybe like a, some frame of reference to the body of this submarine. But then the submarine also has a camera on the end of some robotic arm, right? So this camera is translated away from the center of the uh, sub, and then it can also be pointed in some odd orientation, right? So now this camera frame is both rotated and translated with respect to the sub. Now, let's go even further. Let's say that maybe this camera, you can use it to observe things like fish or other targets in the environment. So this camera can make measurements of where the target is with respect to itself, with respect to the camera frame. Well, now what happens if we want to now express where the location of the target is with respect to the uh, submarine body, or maybe with respect to the, the base of operations, like maybe this is where the sub initially left from or deployed from, and now we want to be able to use this camera on the end of an arm to observe some target and then relate all that back to where is the target with respect to this base of operation. So again, you can see here there are multiple frames at play here, and not only are all of these frames potentially um, rotated with respect to each other, but they're also translated with respect to each other, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate with these red, green, and purple uh, vectors. So all problem one is, again, I'll let everyone read through it um, at their own leisure, but really we're just looking at trying to use these homogeneous transformation matrices to back out uh, uh, the measurement or these vectors with respect to one of these other frames. Again, the thing that makes it interesting in this case is the frames are both translated and rotated. So again, I'll let you look through this. There's a lot of words here, but it's not really that complex. It's basically what we just talked about in two or three sentences. All these words are basically just setting up the specific orientation of one frame to another, as well as the translation of one frame to the other. So you're gonna see that this actually works very nicely. You can actually daisy chain multiple homogeneous transformation matrices together, just like we daisy chained multiple direction cosine matrices or rotation matrices together previously. So really, all problem one is, it's an extension of what we've already been doing, but just taking into account this idea of a translation plus a rotation. Okay, so that's the first part of this week. Then um, I think what we would like to do now is take all of the stuff that we've been building up for weeks one, two, and the first part of week 
uh, or sorry, one, two, three, and the first part of week four. And we are finally getting to the point where we want to start building some equations of motion for the aircraft. So this video right here is developing what is kind of referred to as the flat earth equations of motion. And I'll let you watch the video to see why we call it the, the flat earth equations of motion. What I think is funny is let me pull up the video here. I wanted to, to point this out to everyone. This is kind of funny. Uh, YouTube actually flagged my video right here. They they added this little blurb right here, this little disclaimer um, saying that basically the flat earth is not a real thing. I'm worried that by choosing this title of this video, YouTube now thinks I'm a, a flat earth believer. But again, I think you're going to see why these are called the flat earth equations of motion. It's just an engineering approximation that we're going to make to make analysis easier. I do not believe the earth is flat. I just want to kind of uh, put that full disclaimer out. Um, um, I think this is funny that I got tagged for this. So anyway, that's what this discussion is, okay? In order to fully form uh, our equations of motion, we are actually going to need to now talk about two additional frames. That is the stability and the wind frame, or the stability and the wind axis. Um, and this has to do, and it's very closely related to what is known as the angle of attack and the angle of side slip of an aircraft. So uh, I'll let everyone go ahead and watch this video here. This third video talks about what these two aerodynamic angles are and how they're used to define these additional two uh, frames slash axes. And um, that's going to set the stage for this concept of dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients. This really, we probably could punt until next week, but I didn't want to load everyone up too much on week five, so I'd like to get some of this material in right now. Um, we are going to start getting ready for talking about, you'll see down in week five, we'll talk about wind tunnel testing. Actually, we're going to spend a good bit of time on that. And this discussion here on dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients, hopefully will get us ready for that wind tunnel discussion. So this is the game plan for week four. Let's come back to the homework and maybe look at problem two, because there's only two problems, right? We already talked through the first problem. Problem one is just that um, homogeneous transformation discussion. Problem two will make plenty of good sense, I think, as soon as you watch this video here on angle of attack and angle of side slip. All I'm asking for here is you're going to see that the angle of attack and angle of side slip is going to allow us to um, define a alternative set of states. Right now, we were keeping track of the velocity of the aircraft with respect to the air mass using UVW, right? This was the X, Y, and Z body components of velocity, right? Well, you can alternatively capture that same amount of information using three different numbers, namely the airspeed here, the angle of attack, and the angle of side slip. So it's uh, the, the equivalent information is contained in either set of states. And in fact, this right here, these three equations are the mapping between one set of states to the other. So all I'd like you to do here is just derive these relationships. Where do these come from? And again, I think if you watch the video, it's going to be very clear what these are and how we get them. So this is sort of like a forward mapping, so to speak. Like if somebody gives you a VA, an alpha, and a beta, you can compute what UVW are using these equations, right? Well, it's probably natural then to want an inverse mapping, right? If somebody gives you UVW, how do you compute the airspeed, angle of attack, and angle of side slip? And here's one set of possible inverse mappings right here. And again, all I would like you to do is just go ahead and derive where did we get these from. And then once you've got these two sets of equations, a forward mapping and an inverse mapping, just go ahead and test these with a couple of values and a couple of numbers just to make sure that they uh, they work and provide a little bit of discussion. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll leave it at that because I don't want to give everything away. Um, okay, so there it is. That's what we're doing here during week four. Uh, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think this is probably a good spot to leave it. Uh, send me an email if you have any questions. Otherwise... Um, yeah, well, I'll catch you at the next discussion, and we will really start looking into some interesting stuff during week five. So, again, we're almost done with all of our, our fundamental tool buildup, and hopefully we can start applying this very soon. Okay, I think I'll sign off. Talk to everyone later. Bye.